Our guest today is the congressman from Illinois' 3rd Congressional District. He was elected in 2004 and is now serving his fifth term. He is a member of two House committees, Transportation and Infrastructure, and Science, Space, and Technology. Prior to his election to the House of Representatives, our guest today taught American government at the University of Tennessee and the University of Notre Dame. He earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Northwestern, a master's degree in engineering economic systems from Stanford University, and a PhD in political science from Duke, from Duke University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the City Club of Chicago, Congressman Dan Lipinski. Congressman. Thank you, Jay, for the uh, introduction. Thank you for the, uh, the warm welcome, inviting me to come out here this afternoon. Uh, very honored to be here to uh, you know, contribute, be part of the long, impressive history of the City Club of Chicago, bringing people together to discuss the uh, major issues of the day. Uh, you may have noticed that I may go down there for, my, for some water uh, while I'm speaking. Uh, I'm not trying to impersonate uh, Paul Ryan. I ran a half marathon yesterday. I'm still trying to hydrate, uh, get, get back from that. Uh, and I, I, I couldn't help but notice uh, that uh, there's some news out of one of these city club affairs last week about a certain baseball team on the north side who might move out of their ballpark if they can't get uh, uh, some improvements that, uh, make some improvements that they want. So I'm gonna try to top that today by announcing that when I get back to Washington this afternoon, I'm going to introduce legislation in the House of Representatives requiring the Cubs to move down to the 3rd Congressional District so I can have both the Sox and Cubs in the district. <laughs> now, I'm going to give, them, I'm going to give um, Tom Rooks the choice. Archer and Pulaski, the old Marzano's Miami Bowl, which is now vacant. Orange Line, stop right there. Or 65th in Central down in, down in Bedford Park. I'm sure you always hear those commercials on the radio for, for Bedford Park, great place to relocate your business. They got the space, they got everything there. So, and as a, as a crazy Cubs fan, uh, I'm gonna insist that they move Wrigley Field brick by brick to the new location. <laughs> now seriously, I'm not gonna be talking about electronic scoreboards or announcing my run for governor today. Uh, I'll save that for next time. I wanna talk a few moments about um, Transportation, which sort of keeping on a theme of, of moving. Um, as Jay said, I'm in my fifth term right now. Uh, I'm the most senior member from the state on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Uh, I take great pride in doing what I can to help not only my district, but also the, the entire region when it, when it comes to transportation. And we sometimes forget how uh, blessed we are to be the transportation hub of our nation. Now, what would Chicago be without our transportation system? Now, some might say we'd be Detroit, but um, the comparison hasn't gone over well lately, and in fact, it's not really true. Uh, but we must make sure that we make the improvements to our transportation system here so that we remain the hub. We have to continue to update and upgrade our infrastructure. Now, one of the most important issues, and one most important projects on transportation, I think is somewhat underrated uh, here, is CREATE. Uh, CREATE is the program designed to untangle the, uh, the rail lines in the Chicago region. My father, Bill Lipinski, can uh, rightfully claim to be the, the father of CREATE, so I've always considered to be CREATE a brother. So I take, try to take good care of my brother. Uh, you know, I'm sure some of you know, some of you in this room I know know Create very well. Um, and I wanted to give you a little update on where we are right now with Create. 
In 2005, uh, I worked to secure the first $100 million of seed money for CREATE through the Safety Lou Bill, which was the Highway and Transit Funding Bill uh, that Congress passed in 2005. It was the last really long-term bill that we, we did. Now, CREATE came together as a public-private partnership of the U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation, State of Illinois, State of Chicago, Metra, Amtrak, and the uh, freight railroads. I can't overstate how historic this partnership has been. The region has been North America's freight hub since the 19th century, and unfortunately, some of the infrastructure had gone back almost to that time. A large part of this was because when you have all these rail lines coming in, owned by different companies, uh, there wasn't an incentive to cooperate in getting the infrastructure done here. So what this meant was while it would take two days for some freight that came into the West Coast, two days to get to Chicago, it would take two days to get through Chicago. So a plan had to be developed, and it was, and everyone came together and cooperated to put together this plan around the year 2000. Now today, of the 70 projects identified in CREATE, 17 are now complete. The total program, when all is said and done, is now estimated to cost $3.2 billion. It was originally about $1.5 billion. Uh, there have been about $1.2 billion in funding committed to date on those 70 projects. The federal government has put in about $450 million. The state of Illinois, a little bit more than uh, been $400 million. The uh, railroad's contribution is in the uh, low 200s. Uh, there's talk about a, um, a larger commitment from the railroads. Uh, the city of Chicago has invested about $15 million in, in CREATE so far. Hopefully, uh, well, now, now, now Luann's gone, so I was, was going to see make sure that was, was correct. Uh, but um, I, so it, it's been so far a successful team effort. Now, up to this point, though, CREATE's greatest emphasis has been on improving strategic freight corridors. All of the rail corridor projects under CREATE have been completed or have funding committed to them. But there's one set of projects that's lagging behind. Now, CREATE's most lasting legacy for those who drive on the roads in, uh, in the region is going to be the grade separations. That is the underpasses and overpasses uh, where a road intersects a, a rail line. Now these are going to bring direct observable benefits uh, to everyone uh, from businesses uh, getting their, uh, knowing that they, they can get their, their trucks moving around more efficiently to um, mom and dad coming home from work or going to the store, taking kids to, to school. I hear more about these projects than anything else in my district. Maybe because I have, at least I self-proclaim to have the largest number of uh, miles of rail track of any district, congressional district in, the, uh, in our country. Uh, but this is a very important issue. Now in CREATE, there are 25 grade, grade separation projects. Just two have been completed, four are under construction, the remaining 19 are inching their way through the planning process, and only two of those have the funding to get through construction. Twelve of those have no funding whatsoever. So I can stand up here today and say, and I know a lot of people ask questions about CREATE and, and where is it at. I could say we've been very successful in moving forward the rail projects. Uh, there is more work to be done, uh, but we need to do more to make sure these grade separations are accomplished. I'm going to be working with all the stakeholders to move that forward. But the biggest issue for CREATE and for all of transportation infrastructure right now is the question of how are we going to move forward in getting this done. How are we going to get the money to make these investments? Now, the mo one of the most important groups right now working on this right now in Washington is the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee 
panel on 21st century freight transportation, which I'll just call the freight panel. There are 11 members on this panel, six Republicans and five Democrats, and I'm the only member from the Midwest that is on the panel. Over the next six months, we will be developing a list of recommendations that we can present to the full committee for improving the movement of freight in our nation. This is the first time the Transportation Committee has formed a special panel, and I give the new chairman, Bill Schuster, a lot of credit for bringing this idea to the committee. Right now, on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, we have subcommittees that are siloed. We have one subcommittee for roads and transit, one for rail, one for aviation, and two more to oversee ports and our inland waterways. I believe it's critical that we really have a big picture approach. It review the challenges for freight transportation across all modes of transportation. A, just one shipment uh, of freight can use two, three, sometimes four modes to get from where it's manufactured to a store. It's easy to see this in a very impressive way down in, in Will County. Uh, there are two rail uh, truck intermodal yards down there that make up the largest master plan inland port in North America. And it's something a lot of people may not uh, be aware of. Uh, but uh, it just shows the importance and the growing importance of uh, multimodal transportation. In our region, there, it's not just the trucks on the, uh, on the roads in freight on rails. We also have aviation. When it comes to moving freight, O'Hare and Midway Airport represent the nation's second busiest gateway for international air cargo in terms of value. As a, about 12% of international air cargo that comes into our nation goes through one of those two airports. Now, as someone who grew up less than a mile from Midway Airport and continued to represent Midway Airport, mm -hmm. I can tell you just how important it is to keeping Midway vital, how important it is to the southwest side. And there's an issue right now that uh, with the sequester we still continue to work on is the possible closing down of the tower at Midway Airport, the FAA closing down that tower at night due to sequester. Uh, we're still waiting to hear back from the FAA on, on that, and I'm fighting to make sure that that closure does not happen. Now, last year we passed in Congress the FAA uh, Reform and Modernization Act of 2013. It took 23 temporary extensions of the last law in order to get to this longer term one, just showing how dysfunctional Washington is today. So what we passed last year invests about $63 billion in our nation's aviation system through the 2015 fiscal year and provides some much needed certainty for airport construction projects. Equally important is that the bill works to advance the transition from a ground-based radar navigation to satellite-based navigation next gen, which will significantly increase efficiency and reduce noise and emissions at air hubs like O'Hare and Midway. On the Aviation Subcommittee, I have been working to push forward the investments that the government must make for next gen, in addition to helping uh, to get the equipment needed in the airplanes for next gen to work. You know, it's amazing to me that uh, today we all get around uh, with, with GPS, whether in our cars, on our, uh, on our smartphones, yet we do not yet do that uh, in our aviation system in this country, and we, we need to move that forward. Now, we also have in this region something that we don't think about as much, our inland waterway system. The Chicago Ship and Sanitary Canal, uh, which I visited last, uh, just last uh, fall, I met with uh, some of the operators and employees on, on the barges. Uh, most people may not recognize 
the um, contributions that they make, but they would be amazed at, at how important that is. We're dealing, obviously, with the issue of the Asian carp, and I continue to make sure that we do what we have to do with the electric barrier in Romeoville, uh, make sure that we keep the Asian carp uh, from coming further upstream because we cannot afford to close down uh, that connection. The other problem, though, that, that we have is our aging locks and dams. Some of them are as much as 80 years old. Uh, they're operating much beyond their, their lifespan. And sometimes there are emergency closures uh, because of this. We need to invest in them, but first we need to priorities which, prioritize which projects are going to be done first. This spring, I introduced bipartisan legislation to enact a long-term comprehensive inland waterway system modernization plan. Uh, the bill is called Wave 4. And I'm hopeful that we are going to be able to get at least some of the provisions from this bill in the Water Resources Development Act, which the Senate is about to take up and the House Transportation Committee is going to be taking up this spring. Now, while the work of the freight panel is not going to be completed before we begin to take these, these bills up, uh, the way things work in Washington, I'm pretty sure by the time October comes and the freight panel has released its recommendations, we'll still be working on the, uh, on the word of bill. Uh, so I think this is the first place that the freight panel is going to hopefully have an impact in uh, developing a better freight transportation policy for our country. But of course, the biggest piece of legislation that uh, the freight panel will be influencing is MAP 21, which is a current highway and transit uh, policy and funding bill that we passed last summer. When, we, when the panel completes its recommendations in October, we'll be less than a year from when MAP 21 is going to expire. Now, when we passed MAP 21 last year, it was, it was sort of a mixed blessing. We went through three years of short-term extensions of the last bill, and the bill did give some certainty, at least for 27 months, to uh, planners who are planning our transportation projects. Because especially when it comes to large projects, you need to have time and know the funding is going to be there. Unfortunately, MAP 21 was, was far from perfect, besides being too short. Uh, we went through a very difficult process. You know, first of all, we had to fight against a bill, and I fought against a bill that would have hurt our region very significantly. Not only would have cut down the amount of funding we would get for roads, but would have cut about $450 million uh, from CTA, Metra, and PACE. And I fought with colleagues on both sides of the aisle in the area to make sure that we defeated that bill. So we got MAP 21. One of the things that uh, I fought to get into that bill was the projects of national and regional significance, otherwise known as mega projects. This is the pot of funding that the first $100 million I got for CREATE came out of in 2005 in the last big transportation bill. Now, in MAP 21, the uh, fund was included, but no money was put in there. It was left up to appropriations. The appropriators, the same day we passed MAP 21 in the House, we passed an appropriations bill that gave zero dollars to that. So this is going to be very important, and it's going to be my highest priority on this, this freight panel. Besides creating the in this area, we have Ileana, you know, Ileana Expressway. We have the Western Access to O'Hare. Uh, we have potentially the Central Avenue bypass in, in my district. These are all projects that are going to need large chunks of funding. And it is very important that in this next transportation bill, we have this pot of money for projects of national and regional significance. So that is, that is a high priority as, as we move forward and work on that new bill. But we all know the biggest problem with MAP 21 is it did not deal with where are we going to get the funding going forward? Where are we going to get more funding 
uh, for our transportation infrastructure projects. The Highway Trust Fund, which funds most of this, Highway Trust Fund is, is dwindling. The federal gas tax is no longer providing enough money to keep spending at a constant level even, much less raise spending. The sooner serious discussions start about how we're going to fund uh, our transportation infrastructure projects, the better. We need to put all options on the table. Now, I'm hoping maybe we can learn something in Washington from the states who are actually starting to take a lead on this. Michigan is debating raising fees on vehicle registration to pay for more infrastructure. Pennsylvania is considering raising the gas tax at the wholesale level. And Wisconsin has explored raising more money for transportation by adopting a vehicle registration fee based on miles driven per year, a VMT. Now, Virginia uh, got rid of their gas tax, and they're replacing it with a broader sales tax. Now, I'm not sure that this is the way I would like to go. I like the idea of user fees. But it does show, even in a state like Virginia, with a Republican governor, the decision was made that more money had to be spent on transportation infrastructure. Right now, one proposal that's being bandied about in Washington, actually, uh, Peter DeFazio, representative from Oregon, who is a top Democrat on the Highway and Transit Subcommittee, has put this forward. Uh, he has said we should take the federal gas tax right now, which is 18.4 cents and has not been raised in 20 years, and we should begin to index that for inflation. If we index it by the consumer price index, it would bring in about $50 billion over 10 years. If we index it by the Department of Transportation's National Highway Construction Cost Construction Index, it yields about $150 billion over 10 years. Then, if we put that in place, we can bond on that to get the money up front. And most people are probably thinking, well, this isn't a, a novel idea, the bond, but at the federal level, it is. This is not something that we have done before. This is not something we've had to do. But at times like this, where we're struggling to find a political consensus on how we are going to get more money for transportation, uh, construction, we have to think of every way possible. Now, I also know that it's going to be important to be more open to public-private partnerships. Uh, I could do a whole speech on that. Don't worry, I will not do that. Uh, but I just want to make the point that even with expanded public-private partnerships, we are still going to need to have public funding for transportation projects. It is not going to eliminate that need. Now, one thing that, at least on transportation, that I, I have some hope for in Washington right now, the new chairman of the Transportation Committee, uh, Bill Schuster from Pennsylvania, uh, I think is really, uh, has been very impressive so far. Uh, his father, Bud Schuster, was chairman of the committee in the 90s. And I have to say, you know, the sons of members of that committee in the past have done a great job in the past, and so I, I think uh, I expect that to continue. Now, I, I, I used to tell, it, it became obvious that Bill Schuster was going to be next chairman of the committee probably uh, sometime early last year, and I told him, I hope you're like your father when you become chairman of this committee. His father, Bud Schuster, brought the Democrats and the Republicans together on that committee. It was 75 members, brought them together, took those 75 votes, went to his leadership and said, you need to pay attention to transportation issues. You need to prioritize transportation. And if you don't, I've got these 75 members who are going to vote together in a block. You're going to have a hard time getting anything done if you do not you know, listen to what I'm saying. Unfortunately, uh, I think power has, uh, has gone away from, from committees. But I think there's an opportunity to, to bring some more back. 
Uh, so I think the committee's been off to a good start this year. Our first hearing was brought business and labor together to talk about uh, how are we going to uh, how are we going to fund transportation uh, in, into the future? And we got business and labor there together saying that we have to do something. Uh, and U.S. Chamber of Commerce even um, supported an increase in, in the gas tax. So we need to find some way to do this and, and bring a political consensus. Now, one other thing I want to want to mention. Uh, while I've really focused on, on freight, I don't mean to, to do that uh, because that's what, what we should, uh, should be the limit of what we're looking at when it comes to transportation. Uh, I want to talk one more thing about uh, our public transportation system. We have a great system here. We, we do have needs for, for upgrades, certainly, and uh, John will tell, can tell you all about that. Uh, but there's one particular area that uh, is underserved that I have been focusing on lately, and that's Metro, Metro's Heritage Corridor, which runs from Union Station through southwest Chicago, Willow Springs, Lamont, uh, Romeoville, Lockport to, to Joliet. I've been working hard to uh, get more service added onto that line. There's only six trains, three in the morning and three in the evening, which is far fewer than any other of Metro's lines. Uh, I've been working hard with many leaders who represent these areas to pressure the, the owner of the line, CN, uh, to allow Metro to add at least, just add one more train in the morning and one train in the afternoon. Uh, I believe that th this can be done despite constraints along that line. I'm going to continue to work to get this done. I've met with Brad O'Halloran. Uh, we have talked about options. Metra has uh, options including asking the Service Transportation Board for mediation on this issue. Uh, and I've looked at in considering introducing legislation that would give the uh, commuter railroads more power, uh, more leverage against the freight railroads for lines that the, the uh, commuter agencies run on. I think it's very important that we have a good balance between, you know, in our transportation, transportation system between freight and commuters. And I think that's always important, that that's critically important, critically important that we don't forget that. So and there's one other thing I was going to talk about, but I think I'm going to, I'll be very extremely brief on it. As I said, transportation is not the only thing we have going for us here. In, in the region. One other thing I want to quickly mention, I'm also on, on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. We have two great national labs, great universities here who are doing fantastic research. Our nation spends $133 billion on research every year. If you take out defense, it's still $61 billion. We need here locally and across the country to figure out how we are going to translate all this funding spent on research into more jobs. Something, I was just at Argonne this morning, I was actually there last week also. You may have heard they were given $120 million for a battery hub. Public-private partnerships uh, centered at Argonne, national labs, universities in the areas, businesses in the areas to work to develop better batteries. And this is one way we can do it, that we can bring this research to economic development, and that's something that I'm very supportive and something else that uh, I think we really have to focus on in our region. So I just want to close by saying that uh, we've always been leaders and bold thinkers here when it comes to transportation. And we need to keep that uh, spirit alive as we chart the future for our region. I embrace that challenge. Things are not easy these days, but we, we have to continue to move forward, uh, we cannot forget that uh, investment is necessary for the future, not only for our nation, but especially for here where we live. So thank you very much. If you have questions, City Club E is right here. Ah, Billy Law is first. First is with the most is. Okay. Wait, I think I can answer this before I, you ask it. 
By the way, for those of you who don't know, he owns the Gage and Henri restaurants. In the same building as Roosevelt University. What a coincidence. Okay. Illinois Business Coalition. Comprehensive immigration is down to the wire with significant and bipartisan support. Will you support the bill? We don't mess around with the easy layups, you know. Well, that wasn't a surprise. I, I say that because Billy was just in Washington a couple of weeks ago and we had, uh, we, we had talked about this there at the Restaurant Association. Um, I'm looking at, at the Senate bill. Uh, uh, we are still at the sort of beginning stages, at least in, in the House and even in, in the Senate. Senate's going to be holding its first hearings. It's supposed to be this week. Uh, we've been waiting a while for the uh, uh, group of members in the House who've been working on a comprehensive bill to come forward with theirs. There's talk in the House. The uh, chairman of the Judiciary Committee has talked about doing separate pieces. Um, so the House, as usual, is a mess uh, on what exactly is going to happen. Uh, I am certainly open to a comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, my, my concerns al always are, well, first of all, people who come to this country, I, I believe, however they get here, uh, come here to work hard. Most people come here to work hard to make a better lives for themselves and, and for their families. And it has been what has built our, our nation. Uh, it, in these times, a couple of things, in these times of high unemployment, especially among those who are, uh, uh, who are less skilled in our nation, maybe those who only have a high school education, unemployment is very high. Uh, we have to make sure that any reform does not hurt those people who are already suffering uh, in this economy. Uh, the other thing, we have uh, program Social Security, somewhat uh, Medicare, certainly, and uh, our new health care law, uh, which we need to figure out how we're going to pay for. And we need to figure out, uh, can we afford, what can we do uh, to afford those programs in the future? And those are questions that we're going to have to grapple with and deal with as we look at uh, comprehensive immigration reform. And I'll continue to, uh, uh, to do that. I've, I've met with uh, a number of groups on, on this already, and we're going to see where, where this goes mo moving forward. Uh, two, quest uh, two people, same question. Uh, Steve Murphy from uh, St. Xavier, uh, John Hammerschlag from somewhere. Uh, please comment on the leasing of long term of the leasing long term to management of Midway Airport. Mr. Hammerschlag, where do you stand on city's possible privatization of Midway Airport? Two Midway Airport questions. Well, as we went through the um, discussion of this last time, uh, I'm doing the same thing that I did last time. I'm, I'm open to, the, uh, to a long-term lease. Uh, it's very important to me that not only are the uh, you know, people who use the airport uh, protected the, the flyers, but also those who are in the neighborhood. Uh, the issue that there's always been with um, privatizing Midway is Midway is run very well, and that's what I hear from those who use Midway. Uh, and so finding, someone finding value there, is, I've always asked that question, how is someone, uh, a, a private entity, going to find value at Midway Airport? And I'd like to see what their proposals are, if, they're, if it is going to be privatized, how they envision uh, making it valuable uh, to them. Uh, and so that's really going to be what's based on. So I certainly don't close it off. I understand uh, Mayor Emanuel, just as Mayor Daley did, uh, looking for <laughs> all the time, we're always looking for more sources of, of funding but I think it has to be the uh, has to be the, the right um, uh, the right agreement, and a lot of it's going to come down to uh, what exactly is going into that agreement with whoever may uh, whoever may lease the airport. Okay. Uh, James, is it Mundo, Shoe Chicago? Thank you for being part of the Travel Caucus. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know there was a competition, but okay. Uh, would you support the JOLT Act, which I'm sure you know what that is, which would expand visa waiver program to U.S. allies and reduce visa wait times? This is not a transportation question. It's a JOLT. Go ahead. 
Yes, I do support that. I've been uh, uh, certainly the, the issues of uh, visas in, in uh, with my district that I serve in and also uh, myself being a Polish American, uh, issue of um, uh, Poland not being in the visa waiver program ha has been something I've been working on. Uh, we are now looking through this uh, new bill uh, for, uh, in this way, uh, Poland and other nations would, uh, you know, residents from there would not need to get a visa to come visit our country. I know how hard it is uh, for people to get here, for people coming to my office all the time, weddings, uh, baptisms, they want to be here and have a hard time getting here, and I, I certainly support uh, that bill, and I'm hoping that uh, we may be able, I have better hopes now that we're going to be able to get this done uh, this year, uh, especially with uh, Barbara Mikulski as the chair of the Appropriations Committee in the Senate. I think she's going to be very helpful on that. Okay. Back to transportation. Ron Burke, Active Transportation Alliance. Only, I assume you're correct on this, only one out of four people, Mr. Gates, be ready, only one out of four people, uh, in this, I might, you must be in the region, can get to work on transit in less than 90 minutes. How do we improve that? That seems awfully, 90 minutes. Okay, well, here's the congressman, you handle it. <laughs> I was hoping you were gonna ask a question about cycling. And then I was gonna say, I wish I, I almost wore my, my cycling tie this morning, I wore my Blackhawks tie instead. Um, but, um, well, right now, it, uh, I, I don't know if that, I, I will assume that number is, is correct. I had not heard that um, before. But uh, we unfortunately have a situation, I talked about the Metro Heritage Corridor, and I think that's one area that's underserved. Uh, but the infrastructure is, is there already. Uh, there is talk, there's a desire to, uh, for the red line to uh, go further south. The issue, unfortunately, that we are facing right now is being able to take care of what we have. And I, and I hate to say that, but uh, the needs uh, for the CTA and, uh, and for Metra, especially with uh, the older infrastructure, uh, just keeping that in shape to be able to handle uh, and, and cover the areas that are covered already. I'd love to see an expansion of uh, public transportation and uh, you know, certainly am uh, in support of that. I'm hopeful that this transportation bill that we do hopefully next year uh, will do more. I've always fought, especially for uh, areas such as Chicago that have these um, uh, older uh, public transit systems to be able to get federal funding in order to make the uh, uh, the upgrades that uh, that are needed, and I continue to uh, fight for that. I know how important public transportation is in all of its forms uh, in this region. Okay, uh, these will be quick questions. We're running out of time, and uh, none of them are anything with transportation. Chris to Hammer Gancho, where are you, Chris? You're still around. Good to see you. Uh, thanks for thanks thanks for handing in this real hardball. Are you ready? You have been active in promoting U.S. manufacturing. What are the latest initiatives? Only because I know you, I'm going to answer this question. <laughs> Give a real quick. Uh, I'm working right now. I have a National Manufacturing Strategy Act, which we passed in the House the last two Congresses. Could not get it through the Senate. We're working on another way of doing it this year, getting into the America Competes Act in, in the Science Committee. I'm hopeful that we can get, uh, get that done. Okay, we have uh, the, the McCulsicks. Is that how I pronounce your name? McCulsick? Paul and Audrey. Uh, both questions are basically the same, dealing with senior citizens and sequesters and programs being cut. What's your position on dealing with this? Uh, they talk about uh, uh, meals, uh, senior meals on wheels, Social Security Fairness Act of 2013. Real quickly, what's your position on A, a quick answer on that. Um, Time for answers. <laughs> oh boy, we have a we have a big a big problem right now, obviously, with the uh, sequester. One thing I want to remind everybody, because you can't get this from what you hear on the news, uh, the sequester lasts for ten years. It's not one year. It's not a one-year issue that we have to deal with. 
Uh, I'm hoping that we can continue what, like we did with the FAA to get more flexibility so we can take care of those things in this fiscal year that we that need to be taken care of. Uh, seniors are very important, especially in, in my district, in making sure we have those programs there. Available to them is critical, but we really need to come up with a way to get rid of the sequester by coming up with a long-term uh, debt reduction agreement uh, that we could then eliminate the sequester because it does not make sense to be putting these low budget caps on right now rather than dealing with what we really need to deal with further out in the future. We need to have debt reduction, but I think having these, uh, these low caps on discretionary spending right now are not helping the uh, not helping the economy, but I'm not going to. I won't get rid of the sequester without having a replacement for it. Well, you have a question from one of your constituents dealing with one of the 25 sequester projects on 47th and East Avenue. That's a really important question, and I'm sure the congressman will answer that one if you come up and see him. In fact, I'll even give it to him. Um, and Aaron Turner, we don't have time to discuss guns today. Northwestern student. Uh, we should deal with transportation. So why don't we just give a big round of applause to our speaker.